Uh, hello everyone, thanks for the presentation. This is Kevin and Christophe is with me. Hello. Uh, we both come from uh, Criteo, which is a French company that uh, works in advertisement retargeting. And we are here to talk about uh, debugging and uh, investigations. To give a bit of context, Criteo process more than 200 billion HTTP requests per day across more than 4,000 front-end servers. And when you work at that scale, every teeny tiny bug, the kind that has less than 1% chance of happening, is absolutely guaranteed to occur on one of your production server. So when it happens, it's our job to step in and help the developer uh, diagnose the issue directly on the, the, the production environment and help them fix it. And we noticed that during our investigations, we tend to use the same process no matter what the problem is. And we thought it would be interesting to present you that process during this talk. And so we will show you some of the tools we use, but the main objective is really to uh, show you how we progress on a problem that we know nothing about. And uh, the process is pretty straightforward. The first step is to identify the issue. You shouldn't jump into your tools directly, however tempting that may be. Uh, the first thing you should do is to gather as much data as you can. And you can never have too much data, but it is very important that uh, you need to make sure that it is only data that you can trust because we, we've lost hours and hours investigating issues uh, based on first data, and so uh, just not searching what need, needed to be searched. Once you have your data, uh, you need to put it into context and to understand it, and that's usually the part where you will be using tools to uh, dig further. And the goal here is to try to make hypotheses about what is happening. And once you manage to uh, get a grasp of what's happening, the last and most important step is to uh, verify and to check every one of your assumptions. And more often than not, you will uh, find out that you are in fact wrong and that's the moment where you go back to step one and try again with your new insight until finally you uh, reach the, the truth. And so we're going to show you a few investigations, real-world investigations that really happened, and uh, most of them start from the monitoring dashboard. So Christophe? Yeah, so I won't spend uh, the rest of the presentation to detail each and every part of the of the graphs but uh, our monitoring dashboard is based on uh, graphite and we gather information either from uh, performance counters but uh, for a few months we are uh, more relying on uh, ETW events that are sent by the CLR because they provide more accurate information and uh, here we are in a in a general uh, dashboard and I want to show you the kind of, of reasoning that we are doing when we get a problem. For example, if we imagine that we have a problem with the CPU usage which is on the left upper part of the, of the board, we have to find the possible reason that could explain this spike. So for example, we can imagine that uh, we have a burst of exceptions, so the upper right part of the dashboard should also increase and that would make some correlation between the two. We could also have um, a burst of requests that triggers a lot of allocations, meaning that the, the garbage collection might kick in more often or we spend more time allocating. And in that case, all the, the middle of the board would change and would uh, show us, for example, more Gen 2 or uh, more collection, more lengthy collections. We have this information with uh, ETW now. And uh, we could also imagine some very weird cases such as uh, we get uh, more contention. What I mean by more contention, we get uh, 
spin locks. We try to acquire spin locks, and um, since some of the locks have to spin using the CPU before going down to kernel mode, then we could see some spike in CPU, even if most of the threads are spending their time waiting. So this is the kind of uh, of uh, assumption that you have to make based on this uh, this this board. So um, now we should start with uh, with our first case, and the first case started with uh, this uh, part of the of the board. Again, remember what uh, Kevin tells you in your in in the first step. You need to gather as much information as you need, but also you need to trust what you are looking at. And in that case, the contention rate um, means that it counts the number of time one thread try to acquire a resource. And unfortunately, another thread already had the resource. So it has to wait, and there is a contention for that. And here, what we see with these performance counters is that starting the 15th of June, uh, well, the contention rate increased, meaning that uh, more and more over time, the threads are uh, waiting for other threads to acquire the shared resource. So, Kevin, what could we say based on this uh, information? So before jumping on the tools, we first tried to get to, uh, to make as much deduction as we could from this. First thing to check is what happened on uh, June 15th. In this case, it was easy. It was a day we released a new version of the code. So it seems pretty obvious that we uh, introduced a bug somewhere. Also, uh, what's interesting is that uh, the response time is not impacted at all. Uh, which is good because it means that we, it, it doesn't have any business impact, but still uh, we have something weird happening, so we need to figure out what it is before it starts impacting the business. Also, since the response time is not impacted, it means that whatever contention is happening is probably somewhere in the background. Um, also, if, you look, if we look at the memory usage, we see that there is no increase. And finally, uh, the curve show uh, a progressive, in, in, sorry, a progressive inc increase in time, well, uh, which seem indicative of some kind of leak. But if it is a memory leak, then it is a very small one because the memory is stable. Okay, so um, when we start an investigation, we try to uh, to uh, begin with uh, very simple. Uh, Things as we said, we need to gather as much information as possible. And from part of this information, remember that we are talking about a, a real-world application in production. So we expect to have logs somewhere that could give us information. So you should always think about uh, looking at your uh, your logs because uh, it will uh, most of the time gives you information that will help you to guide in your investigation. But in that case, since it's a, it's a part of the code that tries to acquire a resource through a very specific c -sharp pattern, such as log or a monitor hunter, it's very unlikely that uh, a developer would have counted the time that it has to wait until to get access to the resource. So we were not expecting to get a specific uh, trace in our logs, and yes, we didn't get any any anything in the logs. So what what could be the next uh, the next step? The next step is, as you said, Kevin, we had a, a new version that went to production at that time. So we need to take a look at the code change. And uh, since we we guess, our assumption is that uh, the the change should be in a C sharp code because all these applications. I mean, this application is written in C sharp only, and so we know that this kind of uh, contention uh, is based on, uh, as I said, either a monitor hunter or lock pattern. So it's easy to look at each and every single changes and see if there is a change in the code that looks like a change in this particular C sharp pattern. But unfortunately, it was not the case. So it was not like 10 changes like you can see on the screen. It's like Hundred of, of changes, but it's always good to take the time to uh, to double check that it couldn't be an obvious change that could explain the the uh, changes. So, what would be the next uh, the next thing to do? Okay, so at this point, we uh, try to deduce everything we could from the information we had. Uh, now it's time to start uh, our tools and try to get more information. We want to know where where the contention comes from. 
And it turns out that every time there is a contention event in the CRR, it pushes a special kind of event to ETW, which uh, gives the name of the method that triggered the contention. So for that, we need uh, a tool to listen to the ETW events. There are many tools available, but for this precise use case, uh, I like to use uh, dot trace from JetBrains because it allows you to display everything on a very nice uh, timeline view, uh, which really helps putting things into context. So what we did is uh, we jumped to one of the 40 servers and we captured a trace using uh, dot trace. And once you have the trace, you can activate the log contention filter. And once you do, you see all those marks on the timeline view. And every one of those marks indicate a contention event. And when you hover your mouse on the event, you can see the name of the method that caused the contention. So it's pretty nice. We see uh, plenty of contention events, but we can't do anything for the, uh, with this at uh, this time, simply because we don't really know what contentions, ev what contention events are supposed to be there uh, in the normal case and what are the new ones that were introduced during the, the, during the release. Luckily, uh, during the, the first part, we identified that this was a, a leak and that the contention was increasing over time. So what we can do is let the server run overnight. It's possible because it does not have any direct impact on business metrics. And then the day after, we capture another trace with dot trace. And that's what we did. And you can see just at a glance that there is a dramatic increase in the number of contention events. And then if we uh, try to uh, find out what are the new events, uh, we will find out that there are uh, timer, uh, timer queue timer dot fire events. So I'm not sure what Christoph did here. I don't know. Uh, can you I zoom just... out? Yeah, I try to zoom out. Okay, so it will take a little bit more time, but uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't know why. Well, anyway. it's a it's a very big trace, and it's a slow computer, so it takes quite a bit of time to refresh. Um, anyway, so uh, what we will see is that uh, most of the events are on timer queue timer uh, dot fire. So now that we, oh, I think you can. Uh, yeah. Can move uh, on. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Maybe my mouse is uh, doing the trick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the wheel of the mouse is moving along. Whatever. Yeah. Okay, just go back to the, to the slide, please. Thank you. Um, so now we know that uh, the contention is caused by timer queue timer and the fire method. But we still need to find out uh, what is timer queue timer. It sounds related to timer somehow. And how it is causing contention. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's a good point. At some at some point in your investigation, you will have to leave the source code that you know or the source code of your uh, your uh, application and go into third parties or even uh, the base class library. In our case, the timer queue timer is not present in the Criteo uh, source code. It's uh, it's uh, an internal implementation uh, provided by Microsoft in the base class library to implement timer. So when I need to look at the implementation of the base class library, I'm uh, usually going to the, the website provided by Microsoft, like the reference source or the source of .NET. But uh, if you need to understand how a, a function or a type is uh, calling different functions, it's easier to use a decompiler. And in my case, I'm using ILSpy, but you can use the one that you prefer. So I will spend a a few a few minutes explaining what's going on when you create a timer and you will see the relationship with the timer queue timer so when i'm creating a timer in my code i'm providing some parameters like the callback i want the timer to uh, call when it ticks if i need to provide an additional information to this callback i can pass it as a state and if i need to uh, sorry not if i need when i want to give the time when it should tick i pass the due time if i need it to repeat over a period i'm passing the information in the period parameter here you can see that some of the checks are done and then the timer setup helper function is called 
if you take a look at the timer setup function, what it does, again, a check against null, and then you see that in the M underscore timer field, it's keep track of a new instance of timer holder, and the timer holder keeps track uh, of an instance of the timer to timer, which is the type that uh, we should have seen in a dot trace. So let's take a look at what the timer queue timer does. You know, you see that in the call of the constructor, it passes the same information that you've passed in the constructor of the timer. So we take a look at the timer queue timer constructor, and you see that it keeps track of all the parameters that are, that you've given in your in your code, and then it calls the change method. When you click on the change method, you see that there is a lock. When a new timer is created, then there is a lock to uh, acquire the access to the timerq.instance field. And uh, if we go back to the constructor itself, we see that there is a timer holder in between the timer and the timerq timer. So the timer holder class is a, is a very, very small class, very, very few fields. Only one, which is called m underscore timer, and the m underscore timer keeps track of the instance of the timer queue timer that we've seen just uh, uh, just before. And in addition to that, what it does, it implements a finalizer, and the finalizer role is to ensure that uh, um, the timer will be disposed, will be closed, even if the uh, developer forget to dispose explicitly the timer. So when the um, timer is no more used, the timer holder uh, will be um, out of memory after a garbage collection. And uh, after that, the, um, finaliz the finalization threads will call the finalizer to close the timer. So we ensure that uh, there is no timer left, uh, even if the developer forget to, um, to call dispose. And the last thing I need to show you is the fire method from the timer queue timer. So the fire method of the timer queue timer, as you can imagine, it will fire, it will cause the, the uh, callback function that you have uh, set up. And you can see that the same lock on the timer queue.instance field is uh, acquired. And then after it's acquired, then the callback is called. And after the callback gets called, again, another lock is taken on the same instance. And uh, you can see that when each time the timer ticks, the code needs to acquire two locks. So it looks like uh, it's very uh, close to uh, what we can expect based on the contention that is uh, raising. So from what we've seen, it's maybe easier to have uh, like a picture of what's going on in addition to uh, uh, looking at the source code. So when I'm creating a timer, I'm keeping track of a timer holder instance through the M underscore timer field. And this timer holder responsibility is to ensure through the finalizer code that the timer queue timer will be closed. And the timer queue timer um, relates to other timer queue timers through a link list. And the link list will be uh, managed by the BCL through the timer queue and the S underscore uh, queue field to uh, uh, access the list of all the timers. Um, this is the big picture. OK, so uh, now that we know how the timers can cause contention, uh, we still need to find uh, what is going on with all those timers. Uh, there is really two possibilities. Either we, we are creating a lot of timers, and so they are competing for the lock, or we, are, we have just a few timers, but they tick very often. Um, to go further, uh, we are going to need a new tool. And for that, uh, a good tool is a memory dump. So you can use a proc dump from sysinternals to capture it directly from the live process. And then you can uh, use WinDebug to uh, browse it and find the information you seek. So uh, we've already loaded the SOS extension into uh, WinDebug. That's what allows us to um, browse the managed, managed data structures from the memory dump. And the first thing we did, we did it beforehand because it is a very large memory dump and it takes many minutes to execute. But basically, we executed a dump stat, which display a summary of all the types that are currently in memory. And in there, we want to find specifically 
timer q timer so here we can see that if i find my mouse there it is we have uh, 14000 instances of timer q timer so just like with the contention events previously you need to know what is the normal value for your application and from experience, from past experience, I know that uh, in crypto application, we can expect about 2,000 timers. So clearly, here we have 12,000 timers too many. So the next step will be to find out what are those 12,000 instances doing. So uh, we dump all those instances. So using the, um, the dump heap uh, mt command, or just on clicking on the on the on the type on the hyperlink and then if i take an instance for instance the, the last one if i click on it i can uh, display the fields of that object so we see everything that christoph talked about such as the start six the due time but the part that is interesting for us is the callback the method that will be called when the timer ticks if I click on it, uh, I have an instance of the timer callback delegate. And here, I personally don't know any uh, simple way to get the method name directly from WinDebug. If you know one, you are more, more than welcome to tell me. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we can see that this is an instance method rather than a static method because uh, there is uh, an instance in the target field. And just knowing the type of that instance should give us enough context. So if I click on it, sorry, if I click on it, uh, I will see that this timer, every time it ticks, calls a method on the Kafka.batching.accumulator type, which is uh, a type uh, used by our Kafka driver that we use internally. Uh, but we can't conclude anything yet. Uh, remember that we have a list of uh, 14,000 timer. And if I take the first one, for instance, I do the same thing. First the callback, then the target. And uh, this time we see that it ticks for metrics.core.metametric. So what we would need ideally at this point is a way to uh, summarize what those 14,000 timers are doing. But obviously, we're not going to click on each and every timer because it will take forever. And if any of you has tried scripting WinDebug, uh, you probably know that this is really not something trivial to do. Fortunately, we have another solution. Christoph? Yeah, this is a, a case where the the scale of the search uh, is is uh, is becoming a, a problem for you. Typically, we don't want to uh, to inspect by hand these thousands of, uh, of of timers, but hopefully we can use uh, we can use a, a nugget package called uh, CLRMD, and CLRMD is uh, is a set of types provided by Microsoft that uh, lets you script if I could say script, but I would say write C-sharp code to dig into any of your memory dump or even a live application. So I've written um, a tiny application that relies on uh, the CLRMD nugget package. And what I will be doing, I will be uh, doing exactly what Kevin did by hand, but in C-sharp. So the in initialization code is a little bit different because in WinDBG and, and SOS, everything will be done for you. But here, you will have to call the load crash dump function from the data target. And from then, you get an instance of data target. There is a, a tiny uh, piece of detail that you need to know about CLRMD. It relies on the same uh, DLL that is used by SOS in WinDBG. Meaning the MS Core DAG WKS, it's a, it's a data access DLL used both by the CLRMD runtime and by uh, SOS. And you need to provide some information uh, to both systems. In WinDBG, you can set up uh, the password. You could find uh, this in, um, in the tool itself or on an environment variable. For CLRMD, you need to uh, provide it explicitly through. Uh, 
through the, the create runtime functions. So once you've created your uh, runtime, you get a, an instance of a type called CLR runtime. And the CLR runtime provides a get heap functions that return the heap that will uh, contain all the instances of all the, the types we are interested in. So in our case, I will enumerate each and every object and I will get the address of each and every instances, exactly the way that uh, that Kevin did. But here I get all the objects, not only the one uh, of the type I'm in, uh, interested in. So I need to uh, get the type behind the address through the get object type. It's very close to what you have to do when you are doing a reflection in C Sharp. You get a kind of type info that provides uh, uh, additional information about the instance itself. And in this case, I'm interested in the name. And I will only uh, take the timer callback instances to get access to their underscore target field through the get field by name function. And when I get the description of this field, I can ask for the value. The, the value will be the address of the object that is um, uh, corresponding to the this pointer of the callback. And once I get this address, I will ask for the type. And from the type, I will get the name. Once I've got that, I get the list of all the types uh, that are called by uh, a timer callback. And I'm uh, doing some uh, ordering and all that stuff. And when you run this, uh, this code, and I've run it before because it's a little bit long, uh, we'll see that we have a more than 12,000 instances of metrics.core.metermetrics. So now we have uh, the name of the of the type that is called. Okay, so now that we know the culprit, we still need to figure out what it is. So it is a type that it, it, it's used uh, in the, internally in the critical code base, and uh, we're not going to show the actual code, but just uh, a quick drawing. So nobody used directly the meta metric. Instead, uh, they use a wrapper that we call meta. The meta declare one property that is delegate meta, and it contains the instance of meta metric. And then meta metric uh, declare one field underscore timer, which contains an instance of a timer. And when the timer ticks, it calls back a method on the meta metric. So now that we know that, we still need to figure out what is keeping our uh, 12,000 metametric instances alive. Um, I, I can really see uh, two possibilities. Either uh, something uh, is keeping our meters alive, so we are creating a lot of meters and they never disappear because we have a one root, or we forget to dispose the timers. But uh, like Christoph showed us earlier, there is a finalizer on the timer holder type. So whenever you forget to dispose a timer, even though that's a bad thing, the finalizer should kick in and clean the timer for us. So really, that shouldn't be a problem. So the, the favorite hypothesis should be that uh, we have too many meters. And that's something we can find out easily into the, um, the memory dump. So back to the memory dump. Uh, we, uh, we have our instance of metametric, and uh, we want to find out who is keeping a reference to our metametric. So we expect to find the meter, and from, them, from there, find who is holding the meter. For that, I like to use uh, another extension, which is named SOSX, which declare a few additional commands, and the one I want is refs, which allow to display the reference to an object. You could also use the GC root from SOS, but uh, it's a little bit slower, so uh, and it also provides less information. Yeah, uh, one of the traps of uh, GC root is that it displays only one path to a given root, and it does not tell you all the objects that are keeping a reference uh, to your instance. So if I use refs, then uh, we can see that only one object reference my meta metric, and this is a timer call black. So we have no meter instance holding my meta metric. 
just to be extra sure, another thing we, you, we can do is to search the number of meter in memory. So for instance, if I search uh, metrics.meter, here we can see that we have just 800 instances of meter. So clearly, since meter can hold only one meter metric, this cannot be the cause of our leak. And uh, just to be extra sure, we can also check whether our timer instances have been disposed. So for that, we could use a CRMD like uh, Christoph did earlier. But um, I found out that uh, we often need to script stuff and uh, switching back and forth uh, from uh, WinDebug to Visual Studio then back to WinDebug was a break in the workflow. And so to save on productivity, I wrote a small extension for uh, WinDebug that we have here. We have this little button. And when I click on it, it opens a C-sharp window where I can directly write my script and it will be executed with CRMD exactly like uh, Christoph uh, showed us earlier. So here what I could do is uh, first introduce a variable to count and then get all the instances of my callback. And you can see that it's a, it's a, it's a syntax which will be a little bit different from the one I've, uh, I've shown earlier in, uh, in Visual Studio because uh, it's uh, also using uh, another uh, nugget package called uh, DinaMD that uh, allows you to write more C-sharp-like kind of code. So you can see here that Kevin is uh, trying to uh, get all the timer callback the same way I've done. But here, there is only one call about get proxy, so you will get it only the instances of this type. So you don't have to to check for the for the name of the type, and then you can also check the the type of the of the target if it's not null. Okay, so at this point uh, we have found the timers the timer callback sorry that uh, targets uh, one instance of metametric. So from there we want to retrieve the timer queue timer to find out whether it has been disposed. So for that, uh, we are going to check. Uh, so we have the, the callback. The target field gives us the metametric. Then we have the underscore timer field that gives us a timer. Then we have the M underscore timer field that gives us the timer holder. And finally, we have the M underscore timer field again that gives us a timer to timer. Too many timer. And from there, we can check the m underscore cancel field and check whether it's true. And if it's true, then it means that the timer has been disposed. And then we just increment the count. And at the end, we just display the result. So this is much less verbose than uh, what Christoph did with just uh, CRMD, and you can run it directly from WinDebug. Yeah, the 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 implementation of uh, CRMD and of the extension are available on GitHub. You will get the link at the end of the of the presentation. Uh, so we won't run it live because, like previously, uh, this is a memory dump of like 20 or 30 gigabytes, so it will literally take minutes to execute. But uh, the output will be that none of the timers are disposed. Yeah. So clearly, that's something we don't understand. Yeah, that's uh, if you remember the 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 circle that we've started the presentation with, where the last step is verify. It's typically this kind of case where you end up in a, an assumption. The assumption sounds valid, but what you see in your tool is not really what, what should be there. So you need to verify what's going on. And uh, what we can do is uh, simulate with, uh, with uh, some, some code what's, what's going on. So uh, remember, we've said that the, the, the meter does not count, so we just keep the, the meter metric. And I have a, 
a, a subset of the, the real criteo code, I would say. And what the, the meta metric does, it has in the constructor, it creates the timer that goes to the underscore timer. And what the timer does, it just um, right line tick on the screen every second. And so we should see tick, tick, tick. And uh, in the main, I'm allocating a meter. So these functions just create a meter metric. And after I'm explicitly calling the garbage collector to clean up everything, since the meter metric is no more reference in my application, it should go away. Then the finalizer of the timer holder should go away. Then the finalizer should be executed and the timer queue timer should get disposed. So we should see tick, 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 and then no more tick. So if we run, it's building when it's running. So there is a tick, a tick, a tick, and no more tick. So our assumption about how the finalizer is doing its job with the timer holder seems to be true. Okay, so this is uh, the case where you start to scratch your head because what you are verifying is not really what you expect because it should work, but in production code, it's not working. So uh, let's go back to the big picture and try to um, understand what's going on. This is the critical view of the problem. And if we add into this view, the view provided by the base class library code I've detailed. The timer is referencing the timer holder. The timer holder is referencing the timer queue timer. And we've seen both in the dump and in the test that we've just run that uh, the finalizer on the timer holder kicks in to cut the link to the timer queue timer. And we don't have any root based on the meter because we've seen that we only have 800 instance of meter compared to the expected 12,000. So we have a problem here. So how could we, could we answer this uh, question? In fact, I've uh, been quick to explain the implementation of the of the BCL. And if you remember from my presentation, I mentioned that uh, there was uh, a root, which is the timer queue, with the S underscore, Q, S underscore Q field, which is a static field. So it means that this static S underscore Q field will always be there and will always reference the first timer queue timer in the leak list managed by the BCL. So all the timer queue timer will be referenced from this single S underscore Q, meaning that, yes, we have a reference, so it's not possible to uh, get rid of the timer queue timer. But if you remember, we it's hard to understand how the, the meta matrix uh, reference back to the timer queue timer with the M timer callback, because it shouldn't. But in fact, since it's a static route, the transitivity of the link makes that the meta metric instance that keeps the timer and keeps the timer holder alive is also kept alive by the static route, meaning that the timer holder stays alive so it won't be uh, removed from memory by the garbage collector. And so the finalizer will never kick in and will never cut the link to the timer to timer by never causing close, calling close. So that's why we have this kind of leak. And from that point, you may be wondering why uh, in the verification we did in Visual Studio, the finalizer worked properly. And it's because uh, we make a kind of mistake uh, when we try to imitate the production code. And in fact, we're calling a static method. This lambda is static. And uh, if we look into the reference graph, back into the reference graph, because this is static, it means that we don't have the link from timer callback to the meter metric. And so we don't have this cycle anymore. And so timer holder is not referenced by a root anymore. And so the finalizer could kick in and dispose the timers that we didn't dispose. So at this point, we have uh, a 
an understanding of what's happening. We have uh, many elements that combined together are causing the problem. Uh, the first one is that the method type uh, did not implement I disposable. So this is a mistake when we implemented it. The second fact is that uh, a timer is immortal when it's not disposed. And because it was calling an instance method on meter metric, it was uh, introducing a route that was preventing the finalizer from running. And uh, last but not least, every time a timer ticks, it needs to acquire a lock, a shared lock. And it's even worse uh, because whenever you create a timer, it also needs to acquire a lock. And the duration of that lock is proportional to the number of timers that you have in the queue. So the more timers you have, the longer you need to hold the lock and the more often you need to acquire it. So put together, it explains why we have this uh, significant increase of uh, contention. And so uh, the fix was just to, uh, well, first add a finalizer on meter and then uh, implement I disposable on meter and ask all the teams that use the type to fix their code so that they will dispose it properly. Okay, so this was uh, an illustration of uh, that debugging process. Uh, first, identify the program, gather as much data as you can, make sure it's data that you can trust. Then understand, use tools to dig, de to dig deeper, sorry. Try to make hypotheses about what is happening. And finally, verify every one of your assumptions and when you discover that they are wrong, you go back to first step and then try again with a new insight. This was a bit of a naive example. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are many of you that already encountered uh, problems of uh, leak of timers. But just to underline how important the last step is, uh, we prepared another investigation, so another issue that we had. And just like the previous one, uh, it started from our monitoring dashboard. So this time, the, uh, the part of the dashboard we were looking at was the uh, exceptions. And uh, as you can see here, the number are just huge. Meaning huge, it's like almost 1 million exceptions per second. So these um, performance counters shows you the number of first chance exceptions, meaning the exception that uh, are raised in your code, but are um, uh, managed by a try catch block. But we know that if we have these amounts of exception occurring per minute, it's like more than 10,000 per second. So we are expecting that our application is just dead and does not respond anymore. Is it the case, Kevin? And yet, this is not the case at all. Uh, the application was working properly, and in fact, it took us uh, more than one day to notice that there was uh, something going on. And except a slight increase in CPU usage, and of course, the number of search chance exceptions that we see here, uh, there was really no noticeable impact whatsoever. And so, uh, yeah, this is a performance counter that counts the number of first choice exceptions. Yeah. So uh, the next step would be to, to take a look at the logs. Yeah. So uh, obviously, with uh, 10,000 exceptions per second, we expect to find something in the logs. And uh, surprisingly, uh, we couldn't find anything in any of the, of the logs. That's the first part of the of the mystery. Um, so what we need to get now is getting more information. And uh, from the top of our mind, what we would need here is at least the name of the exception. If we know the name of the exception, then we can start to take a look at our source code and see in the changes, if it was a new release, um, where we could have uh, new exceptions that that uh, would have magically appear in such a, a huge number. So we started to uh, use um, a sysinternal tool called ProcDump, uh, which is the tool that we are using to, uh, to take the memory snapshot of exceptions, uh, usually. But here, you can use it not to take a memory snapshot of the uh, application, but to list on the screen in the console application uh, all the exceptions um, that are caught by your code. So this 
uh, you can use this uh, this command line. It's a very nice command line. But uh, I would suggest that uh, instead you rely on a ETW event because uh, it's uh, it's less expensive. What I mean by less expensive, with uh, this case of more than 10,000 exceptions per second, it was the first time in my life, and it's not a short life, that I've seen a sysinternal tool going back on his knees. I mean, with this kind of uh, pace, Prog dump was extremely slow, started to have an impact on the application itself, but at least we could see that there was a thread about exceptions. So then uh, the next step uh, upon seeing a thread about exception was checking the source code whether we call thread.abort somewhere. Yeah, because you, we are not supposed to call thread.abort. Okay, guys, if you don't know that rule, you are not supposed to call thread.abort. This is bad. And uh, that's where it really becomes uh, well crazy because uh, we managed to find one change in the code where uh, a call to thread abort was introduced and in this very same application, but it was removed less than a week before the release. So this is an extraordinary coincidence. And because of that, just to make extra sure, we went on the production server, we retrieved the deployed assembly, and we decompiled it with ELSPY just to make extra sure that this wasn't the version with uh, the thread abort. That's a very important thing that you have to keep in mind. You remember in our three steps, the first one about identify, meaning gather as much information. The second part is also important. You need to trust this information. So don't be afraid to go to the production server and take a look at uh, what's really deployed there. There is no risk because a decompiler does nothing on the server, but you have to double check and be extra sure that the code that is running is really the code that you think is running. So the next step, uh, we try to gather more information. And so we attached uh, a live debugger uh, from Visual Studio directly to uh, the process uh, in production. Uh, that's really uh, some kind of last resort. And we noticed that uh, from time to time, every few seconds uh, between the thread abort exceptions, it would also throw uh, cannot unload abdomen exception. And this is very interesting uh, because uh, we know two things about that. Uh, first, we know that whenever you unload an abdomen in a .NET application, then the Sierra will try to abort all the threads on that abdomen. So that could explain the thread abort exception that we see. Another important fact is that this application is running on ASP.NET, and ASP.NET is known to unload the app domain whenever you make a modification, for instance, in the configuration file or in the application file. So of course, it could be tempting to uh, think that somebody is editing the, the web.config file, but it's very unlikely that this person is doing that 10,000 times uh, a second and on a production server. So clearly that was something else. And digging further, we noticed uh, two uh, very weird facts. Uh, well, the first one, uh, the nice fact, <laughs> is that it's always happening, the thread abort exception is always happening on the same core stack, which is kind of nice because it means that we can focus focus our investigation on just one part of the code. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's something you can expect, meaning that you might have one bug. So it's 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 uh, expected that the, the problem comes from the same place in the code, meaning the same call stack. And the second fact that we had a bit of, tr of trouble accepting is that uh, the thread about exception was always, always happening on the same thread. And to make extra sure, we uh, even uh, checked that the reference to the thread object was always the same. And yes, it, it isn't just a collision in the thread ID or whatever, it is always the same thread. And uh, what, is, uh, what is surprising, uh, it's surprising because uh, you're not supposed to be able to catch a thread about exception. I mean, you can catch it, but then it will be rethrown uh, after, after the, the catch block. Uh, so at the very least, we had the core stack, so we uh, took a look to uh, the source code. And what's happening is that we have some kind of infinite loop. Inside, we have a try catch block. Uh, we uh, we are processing some stuff. In fact, we are uploading uploading data to a remote server. 
and then we sleep for uh, 15 minutes. So I honestly don't know why this isn't a timer. Maybe uh, maybe the developer was uh, afraid after the timer leak earlier. But whatever, it's it's irrelevant. But the important part is that uh, we have a catch block, and whenever an exception is thrown during the the uploading we go into the cache block and on purpose we retry immediately because if an exception occurs then it is very likely an io error and so we want to try again immediately because it should work and so the first intuition that we could have is that uh, whenever there is a thread about exception inside of the try block then we catch it and then uh, when we leave the catch block then immediately we go back in the try catch block and then the exception is restrained and so on and so on but because of what we know about the thread about exception this shouldn't be possible yes exactly because uh, from our experience the thread about exception is a little bit different from the other ex exception instead of uh, being re being rethrown like like this because expecting that IIS would again throw there, so we can try and catch again. We know that the thread about exception, when it leaves the last bracket of the catch, meaning after here, it will be rethrown, but outside of the of the try. And so, in that case, from our knowledge, from our experience, we know that once one thread about exception happens, okay, it will be caught and then it will be rethrown immediately after the last um, sequence. So meaning that you won't have uh, an infinite loop. The loop will stop after the first thread about exception. And so we, uh, we stay stuck uh, like this uh, for a moment. We double uh, triple checked every one of, the, of our facts, but uh, no matter what we did, we, uh, we reached the same conclusion. Uh, first fact, we have more than 10,000 thread about exception per second. Uh, we're 100% sure of it. Second fact, uh, the exception is occurring always on the same core stack, at least as far as we can tell, because obviously we didn't catch every of the 10,000 exceptions. Third fact, it's always occurring within the same thread. So, uh, put together, those threads challenge everything we know about a thread about exception. Uh, after I uh, remained stuck uh, for a few hours, uh, we had to accept that, uh, I mean, yeah. if, you, if you exclude the impossible, then whatever remains must be the truth. Okay. And so we decided to check what we knew about a uh, thread about exception. Remember this last step, the step number three, like you need to verify what you think you know. Uh, we wrote the, the kind of uh, code that should be exactly the same. If you remember uh, here, the sum method, sum condition, it's exactly the same code here. You have exactly the same code. So we written a tiny console application that does exactly the same code in the sum method. I'm creating a thread that called this method, this infinite loop, and then I'm aborting the thread after I press the uh, enter button. And so I'm expecting to have this uh, this infinite loop, and we will see in the the right line here. We should see a lot of uh, exception with the uh, thread abort here over there. So the infinite loop should should go on. So if we start this and we run it we see that it's it's working waiting for 15 minutes and when i'm pressing the enter i will get only once the thread about exception which is what we expect which is what we have known for years uh, by using the dotnet framework so this is not what we see in, in production so again think about what could change between the code that you are testing remember the example that we've provided with the static function instead of the instance function for the timers so here what could be different and we have uh, two keys difference uh, compared to the code that is running on the production server 
For starters, we are running in debug mode, so always make sure that for your test, uh, you are running in release because there are a lot of optimizations that are kicking in only in release mode and it could change the behavior of your application. And yeah, so, Too bad. so this is not enough. And the third thing that changed is that uh, the production server are running in 64 bits. And when you compile in any CPU, per default, if you don't change the properties of your project, it will run in 32 bits. So uh, if that's the case, make sure to compile in x64 or change the property of your project to run exactly in the same conditions as your servers. And when we do, indeed, we manage to uh, reproduce the issue. So um, we need to uh, to verify what we what we think is is good. But again, if we think about what we know about the thread abort exception, when we call thread dot abort in uh, the code, it's not a kind of kill functions. It's an asynchronous effect. What it does, it sets the abort requested flag in the corresponding thread objects. And uh, the uh, thread about exception is thrown by a different code in the context of the running thread in uh, what is called the safe place that is defined by the just in time compiler. And the just in time compiler generates code to rethrow the thread about exception after the catch block. So this is what we know. But here, what we've seen is that uh, in 64 bit, we have a difference. And uh, the fact is that uh, when you run in 64 bits, one of the things that change is that you're not using the same JIT. You are using uh, Ryu JIT, which is uh, the new, but well, it's not exactly new, it's still a few years old, uh, the new JIT. And uh, whenever you say new, uh, you tend to say bugs. So uh, it's probable in this case that we run into a, a bug of the JIT. And there is one way to find out. If we go back to our test application, uh, you can uh, opt in to the old JIT using a configuration key. So if you check on your application configuration file, you can add uh, the runtime node, if you don't have it already, and then the use legacy JIT configuration key, and uh, set the enabled flag to, uh, to true. Uh, enabled. Or, uh, yeah, okay. And then uh, with this situation, we will be running the same code in 64 bits, but with the old JIT, and we can see that the exception is gone. So it confirmed that uh, we run into a bug directly into the JIT. So we uh, reported that, code, that uh, bug to Microsoft. Uh, it's still not fixed uh, in 4.7.2, so I don't know if it will be fixed someday. Um, it's not happening in .NET Core because there is no thread abort exception in .NET Core, so it's convenient. Um, also, one interesting thing is that uh, we dug further to try to understand why we didn't get any log, because in the catch block, there was, in fact, a call to a logger, so this was puzzling us even more. And it turns out that by inspecting the call stacks, we deduced that, uh, well, we are actually using an asynchronous logger so that we can log uh, without impacting the response time. And uh, the thread of the asynchronous logger was one of the first being aborted, and that's why the logs were piling up in the logging queue and were, weren't outputted uh, where we could read them. Anyway, um, the key takeaway of uh, those investigations is uh, first, you need, really need, before jumping on your tools, to gather as much data as possible and data that you can trust. And uh, well, the more data you have, uh, the more time it will save you on the long run. So it's really important. Also, uh, don't hesitate to use, uh, for instance, CRND and other, uh, other frameworks to build the tools that uh, you need for a specific purpose and to save time. And uh, the most important point is really uh, assume nothing and uh, verify every single one of your assumptions because, uh, well, if you're like us, you will notice that more often than not, you will turn out to be wrong.
So don't be afraid to face it and uh, just make sure to double check everything. There is also uh, an additional point that uh, we have noticed is the fact that when you are doing an investigation on your own uh, and when you get stuck, it's uh, always a good idea to uh, go and talk to one of your colleagues and uh, he or she doesn't have to know anything about the problem, but just the fact to think about how you will explain the problem to your colleague will help you to uh, find more assumptions, maybe to get more ideas because the person will think in a different way that, than you. And it's a really, really good trick to use in your uh, investigation. So uh, I don't know if there is any question at this point. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I checked there's a, there's a couple of really specific questions. Um, I will send those over to you afterwards uh, so that we can include them in the blog post afterwards because yeah, they're, they're not really 100% related to, uh, well, not very easy to answer at this point in, uh, in the talk, I think. Okay, okay. So, um, with that, uh, Kevin and Christophe, thank you for uh, for your session. Really interesting. Um, we will be posting this one on our blog uh, later on. Uh, we will include the resources that you had up on the slide as well, uh, so that people can try those things for uh, their own. Uh, if you have any feedback on this webinar, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter or to email or find Kevin and Christophe on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, with that, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Um, and we'll see you in a future webinar. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.